It is still technically high school football season, so I got a few more weeks. Got to pack these analogies in while I can. After every game, we as a football team, we watch film. Sometimes it's a blast. You can highlight individual efforts or individual plays, watching with the boys. Sometimes it's wonderful. Other times, not so much, especially when the boys screw up. So coaches will go through and they'll put notes down saying, here's what went wrong, here's how to fix it, things like that. And at least once a game, at least for the offensive line, I will put a phrase that sounds something like this. This is not how this play was supposed to look. Maybe it was a missed assignment, maybe it was a mental error, maybe it was a lack of effort. But whatever happened, it wasn't executed properly. The play wasn't the way it was supposed to be. Now, are you, like me, using that phrase more often than you imagined when you look at the state of the world? Do you, like me, look at the world, see what's going on, and so often say, it's not supposed to be this way? For example, maybe some of you heard that we now have a holiday tree at the Capitol in Madison. That's going back to the way it was before. It's no longer a Christmas tree. Okay, that's no surprise. But maybe you didn't hear about the theme of the ornaments this year. School children around Wisconsin will be making science ornaments. And if that doesn't stand out, do you realize what the whole point of it is? It's a mockery of Christianity. To say, oh, we're going to decorate the tree with science is saying, well, there's science, and then there's religion, that hokey stuff. So just think about it. A tree that Christians use to celebrate the birth of our Savior is now being used not just to mock Christmas, but to openly mock the idea that there is a deity. Things are not supposed to be this way. Or, if you watch the news, I don't know why I still do it, there's a hit-and-run epidemic in Milwaukee. Children are being hit, in a couple of cases, killed. And what's going on? People are driving away. One guy tried to spray paint his car and tried to sell it online so he could avoid persecution or prosecution. Just think of the callousness that it must take to hit and kill a child with a car and then race away and act like none of it ever happened. It's not supposed to be this way. Or, and I should have brushed up on this, I think I'm getting the details correct, that issue in Texas with the six-year-old boy who thinks he's a girl. Mom and dad are separated or divorced, and mom is pushing for a chemical castration because this boy wants to be a girl. Dad is fighting her in the courts, and he is losing. It's not supposed to be this way. And you know, I could go on and on and on because there are so many goofy, messed up, horrible, wrong things going on. You look at the world, you want to scream. It's not supposed to be this way. But maybe you're also like me that you don't just say it when you look at the world. You say it when you look at your own life and your own family. We fall prey to a temptation we have told ourselves a thousand times we would not give in to, but we did. It's not supposed to be this way. I'm a Christian. A close relationship uh, breaks. A family member wants nothing to do with us, and, and we have no idea why. It's not supposed to be this way. Someone we care deeply about is drifting, if not sprinting from the faith. It's not supposed to be this way. We have doubts and concerns and worries even though we know God's word is truth, even though we're Christians. It's not supposed to be this way. When we look at the world, maybe we shout it, but when we're focusing on our own lives, maybe we whisper it or say it through tears. It's not supposed to be this way. But I would venture to say that things are exactly the way they're supposed to be. And they are because sin is a part of this world. And it is not a small part. Sin affects and infects everything. No one comes away unscathed. And whose fault is sin? It's ours as human beings. We brought sin into this world. And I know our world is one that does not want to talk about consequences for actions, but you cannot separate sin and its consequences. Because of what we as humanity did, relationships break, bodies break down, friendships fall apart. That which is ungodly and improper and totally wrong is praised, and what is godly and proper is put down. Sin and bad things happening because of it go together like coffee and cream and beans and rice. Because of sin, things are exactly the way they're supposed to be. And even the Lord himself would agree with that. I know that sounds like a strong statement, but think about it. Imagine if there were no consequences for sin. Imagine we could do whatever we want, go against God's will, and everything just works out fine. Would we care about him at all? 
Would we ever think about him and his will? Would we put him first in our lives? No. Instead, we would be ridiculously self-focused. We wouldn't humble ourselves. We wouldn't seek his grace and mercy. We wouldn't call on him because why would we? Everything's fine. Why do I need him? In truth, it is an act of love that God lets things get nasty and messy when sin rears its ugly head. Because it drives the point home that things aren't the way they should be from his perspective. And it drives the point home that there is a way things are supposed to be. There should be perfect love among God's people, patterned after his love for them. There should be perfect harmony no matter which group of people you're talking about. There should be no aches and pains and medications and doctor visits because there should be no sin. That's the way God made it. That's the way God intended it to stay. But mankind, and that includes us too, we ruined that. We brought sin into this world and now we deal with the consequences. And as we deal with those consequences, we also do something else. We long. We long for peace. We long for things being right. We long for contentment and and being able to lay down and rest. We long for the time when we don't have to say things aren't supposed to be this way. We long for the time when we can say this is exactly how it should be. We long for that, but we're never going to get that in this world. As long as people have been a part of this planet, they have been thinking if just the right combination is found, if just the right nation or just the right people or just the right right leader arises, then we will have this veritable paradise. But it will never happen. A, history bears that out. But B, that will never happen because sin will always be a part of this world. So we have to shift our focus. We have to shift our attention. We have to focus on the place, the time, when things will be the way they're supposed to be. And that will only be in heaven. The heaven that John describes for us in our lesson. Let's briefly walk through it. He says, The angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. So heaven is described as a city, and so often when we hear cities, what do we think? We think what we see on the news coming out of Milwaukee or other big cities. Crime, prostitution, drugs, gangs, all those kind of things. Well, that's not this city. Because this city is perfect. This is our heavenly city. And in this city, there is a river. The river of the water of life. So what is that water of life? It's grace. It's mercy. It's peace. It's love. It's all the things that our souls long for. It's all the things that we as believers need the most. We understand that grace and mercy now, and we thank God for it, but in heaven we will fully get it. And it will flow over us the way Water flows over a rock and a river. And every river has a source, has a head. So does this river. It comes from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The grace and peace and mercy and all that good stuff we need, that comes from the Father who in love sent his Son for us, and it comes from the Son who became the Lamb who was sacrificed. And because of that, yes, now we get it somewhat. In heaven we will perfectly know. It will be perfect life. Everything the way it should be. God and man in perfect communion, a communion made a reality by Jesus. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every every month. And the leaves of the tree, (coughs) excuse me, are for the healing of the nations. Remember the tree of life from Eden, the eat of it and you'll live forever tree? Well, sin barred access to that. But with sin gone, the gate is gone. God's people in heaven are encouraged to eat and eat and eat and eat again. And the result of that, not the discord and disharmony and anger that we see in this world. Instead, there will be perfect relationships among perfect people whose every delight is to be with one another, gathered around the Lord. It will be the way it's supposed to be. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. Right now, we are experiencing the curse. Because of sin, relationships break down. Families fall apart. We march toward the grave. At the end, we trot toward the grave. And that which is right and godly and proper is put down, and what is the opposite of that is praised. Those are all consequences for sin. But sin will not follow us through death. We will leave it behind. And what will our new reality be? We will stand before our Lord. 
And not in the way as a, a convict stands before a judge waiting to just get hammered. Instead, we will bow before our Lord, thanking him because of what he did. Thanking him that he took us out of, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, and brought us into, this is exactly how it should be. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. <clears throat> Sin and unbelief are often referred to as darkness and that's how we came into this world. But at our baptisms, God wrote his name on our forehead. He shined his light on us. We were in the light, but the darkness is still all around us. Temptation and sin and all those things. But in heaven, the darkness is gone. The light just blasts it away. The light of the glory of God will shine upon us. And not just here and there, not just now and then. It will shine every day, all day, for all eternity. So much so that there doesn't even need to be another light source. God's gracious, loving, forgiving light shining on people forever and ever and ever. Everything as it was in the beginning, everything the way it's supposed to be at the end. Now maybe you're thinking, okay, great, it's always good to talk about heaven, a reminder of what's coming, but how does that help me now? Right now, I have the family struggle, or the health struggle, or the emotional struggle, or the job struggle, or the spiritual struggle. I question things I know I shouldn't question. I have doubts, like, like I'm getting paid by the hour for them. I'm struggling, I'm hurting, and I'm dealing with it right now. This is all good stuff, but that could be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years away. How in the world does heaven talk help me when I'm in the midst of things not being the way they're supposed to be? Well, it helps because when we know something better is coming, we can put up with a lot. Let's say you're at Six Flags. A new roller coaster opens up. You get at the back of that line, you're like, why am I here, right? Two hours to ride a ride. But then you wait the two hours and you ride it and it's, it, it's amazing, it's enthralling and you have these great memories. Or maybe this is a better example. After Christmas, we're going to start the renovation of the new offices. I lose my bathroom, but I'm not bitter or anything about that. So it's going to be messy here for a couple of months. A lot of sawdust, a lot of junk. You'll see big, ugly plastic tarps around. But why are we going to be joyful during that time? Because we know at the end, something better will be here. We'll be able to more effectively carry out ministry. We can put up with a lot when we know something better is coming. Well, that's a million times more true when it comes to spiritual matters. The cross does a lot of things for us, but one of the best things it does is it shows us our future. Because of Christ's work, with sins forgiven, with rap sheets clean, with hearts of faith, and with the robe of righteousness our Savior won and put on us, in time we will enter our heavenly home. That's what he came to accomplish, and that is exactly what will happen. And how does that help us now? Because it gives us hope. And not the, gee, I wish, I think. No, we're talking about a sure, solid confidence. And that hope sees us through things and being the way they're not supposed to be. When we do have struggles in our family, we have hope for a time in the future when there will only be perfect relationships. When we are questioning and struggling and our faith is far from certain, we have hope in that time when we won't even need faith because we'll see it with our own eyes. When we're struggling physically or emotionally, we look ahead with hope to the time when perfect healing will be ours at our Lord's side. It doesn't matter what the issue is, but whenever things seem to be not the way they're supposed to be, with a, a heart full of faith and hope, we can look ahead to a time when that won't be the case, when everything will be exactly the way it's supposed to be. God and his people together in perfection. And knowing that is our future, we will not just make it through this life. We will march confidently through this life. Even though things may not be the way they're supposed to be in our minds, we're ready to, to walk confidently, no matter what the world throws at us. Because in Christ, we know heaven is our home, and we know we will be there. So knowing that, we let go of the disasters. We let go of the mistakes. We let go of the way we've screwed things up. We let go of what's going on in this world, and we focus on our Savior. We focus on his work, and we focus on his soon-to-be-fulfilled promises. It's coming. All we have to do is wait. Everything will be the way it's supposed to be. 
And for all eternity, we'll thank the Savior who made that a reality. Amen.